Nine, Camus' tuberculosis returned, and he was consequently forced to live in seclusion for two years. During which time he worked on uh, The Rebel, a book-length essay which treats both metaphysical and historical development of rebellion and revolution in Western civilization. Published in 51, the work examines numerous writers and artists, including, among others, Epicurus, Lucretius, the Marquis de Sade, Hegel, Dostoevsky, and Nietzsche. One of the main arguments in the book is that the urge for revolt stems from a desire for justice or a rejection of accepted metaphysical as well as social and political norms. Most rebellions, revolutions, if you look at them when they are rationalized or explained, are doing so usually in the name of justice. The lack of justice and the need to change the system so it is more just. That is injustice, as he takes it, found not only in political systems, but in the traditional concept of God. How can God be unjust? Well, if you've experienced Auschwitz, you might want to consider that. Um, and also a, a variety of experiences in just day-to-day -day living. He also claims that one of the responses of the death of God in Western civilization was the rise of utopian materialist political philosophies, such as communism and fascism. These were attempts to replace the meaning system that had really died. These were totalitarian systems. A true rebel according to Camus, avoids totalitarianism. He avoids responses that are absolutist. This is because absolutism leads to murder. You see the connection? If I am absolutely certain of a certain position or ideological system. That can rationalize my doing just about anything to see that it comes to. He saw this at work both in fascism and in communism, where at one level a seemingly well-meaning utopian view, the equality of all people, the sharing, etc., can become a reign of terror. And that's because it is taken to be absolute. According to Camus, rebel, rebels never take absolute positions. They are uncertain even of their uncertainty, which seems a bit of a paradox. This upset many of the uh, intellectuals of this time. You remember post-war Europe and even in the United States, there was a very strong identity with what had happened, by, especially the people on the left, in, the, in what would be the Soviet Union. This was before what was actually known what was going on with Stalin and the purges. And even after that started to be known, people found it very difficult to do what? Turn away. Once you've come, and this is what Camus, once you've committed yourself to an absolutist system, one of the most difficult things to do is to turn away from it. Because you have now rooted your identity in it. And what could be worse than at the end of your life saying, I was wrong. Um, so a true rebel holds against both things. It's not except absolutes, whether religious or secular. Here we strongly see stated that aspect of existentialist thought that opposes systems. Remember I mentioned that? Opposed the systems. Specifically, Camus was making clear his rejection of communism as it was being expressed in post-war Russia and Eastern Europe, which caused his break with Sartre, by the way. 
because Sartre was infatuated with uh, communism. He later got kicked out of the party, which isn't surprising. The third theme in the rebel is that of crime. In this regard, he discusses the role of crime in the rebellious spirit. How rebels in different epics rationalize their crime. They rationalize it in the name of some system of meaning. Again, it's the lack of moderation, the desire for absolutes that he claims is at the source of human crime and especially political crime. Two short passages illustrate the book's overall intent. The rebel undoubtedly demands a certain degree of freedom for himself, but in no case is he consistent, if he is consistent, does he demand the right to destroy the existence and the freedom of others, which is what big systems are out to do. He humiliates no one. The freedom he claims, he claims for all. The freedom he refuses, he forbids everyone to enjoy. He is not only the slave against the master, but also man against the world of master and slave. Therefore, thanks to rebellion, there is something more in history than the relation between mastery and servitude. Unlimited power is not the only law. It is in the name of another value that the rebel affirms the impossibility of total freedom while he claims for himself the relative freedom necessary to recognize this impossibility. If the duration of history is not synonymous with the duration of the harvest, then history in effect is no more than a fleeting and cruel shadow in which man has no part. He who dedicates himself to this history dedicates himself to nothing and in his turn is nothing. This was a reference to Marxist view that history becomes God. The utopia at the end of the line. If that's your, what you're dedicated to, according to Camus, you've given up your soul. You are no longer a rebel. You are a follower. In 1956, he published his last major novel, La Chute, or The Fall. One of the more interesting, I might say, perhaps difficult, of Camus' novels. It's set in Amsterdam's red light district. It consists of a series of monologues by the self-proclaimed judge penitent Jean-Baptiste Clemence. People have often noticed that Jean Baptiste, in general, John the Baptist. As he reflects upon his life to a stranger, the bulk of the narrative unfolds in a bar called Mexico City. <laughs> in what amounts to a confession, Clemence tells of his success as a wealthy Parisian defense lawyer who was highly respected by his colleagues, and then his ultimate fall from grace. Late one night, when crossing the Pont Royal on his way home, Clemence came across a woman dressed in black, leaning over the edge of the bridge. He hesitated for a moment, but continued on his way. He had only walked a short distance when he heard the distinct sound of a body hitting the water. He stopped walking, but did nothing. Camus writes, the sound of screaming was repeated several times as it went downstream. Then it abruptly ceased. The silence that followed as the night suddenly stood still still, seemed indeterminable. I wanted to run, and yet didn't move an inch. I was trembling, 
I believe, from cold and shock. I told myself that I had to be quick and felt an irresistible weakness steal over me. I had forgotten what I thought then, too late, too far, or something of that sort. I was still listening as I stood motionless. Then, slowly in the rain, I went away. I told him no more. His reflection upon his failure to act, and remember existentialism is a lot about acting, sets Clemence on a downward spiral. He arrives at the conclusion that his whole life has in fact been lived in search of honor, recognition, and power over others, hypocritically and selfishly. He proceeds to destroy his flattering reputation by making public comments that he thinks will be received as, a, as objectionable, like telling beggars they're embarrassing people, or announcing the publication of a manifesto exposing the oppression that oppressed people inflict on us. I think I've heard that. <laughs> However, to Clemence's frustration and dismay, his efforts in this regard are ineffective because he finds out that most bourgeois people accept it. He finally responds to this growing emotional, intellectual crisis by withdrawing from the world. He closes his law practice, he avoids colleagues and people in general. He then throws himself into uncompromising debauchery, a form of hedonistic rebellion that Camus thinks is essentially escapist. Sort of Caligula type approach, but without political power. War breaks out and he decides to go to Paris. Eventually he is arrested by the Germans and thrown into a concentration camp. He is selected to lead a group of prisoners as their poet. He's afforded certain powers over them, such as how to distribute food and water and decide who will do what kind of work. Let's just say that I closed the circle, he confesses, the day I drank the water of a dying comrade. His final conclusion is that with the death of God, one must also accept by extension the idea of universal guilt and the impossibility of innocence, a type of original sin without God. At one point, he even concludes that Christ was guilty due to the slaughter of the innocents. You know the story where Herod kills all the babies so that Jesus can escape. Jesus has the blood of the innocents on him. Perhaps drawing on Nietzsche's comment that Jesus' crucifixion would have been more heroic had he actually been guilty. That's one to think about over dinner. That's your only assignment. Take that question and reflect on it. It's an inner, it may take you some place. Anyway. <laughs> Consequently, through his confession, he sits in permanent judgment on himself and others, spending his time persuading those around him of his own unconditional guilt. He's not so much judging others as demanding that they honestly judge themselves, that they not hypocritically hide behind systems of ethics, which don't pursue the matter much deeper than the surface. He also posits somewhat paradoxically that freedom su from suffering is attained only to a submission to something greater than oneself. The novel ends with the following lines. Pronounce to yourself the words that years later haven't ceased to resound through my nights, and which I will speak at last through your mouth. O oh, young girl, throw yourself again into the water, so that I might have a second chance to save the two of us. 
But then listen to this. A second time, <clears throat> what imprudence. <laughs> Suppose, dear sir, someone actually took our word for it. It would have to be fulfilled. But let's assure ourselves it's too late now. It will always be too late, fortunately. Now, these lines have caused many to wince, as I saw. As on the surface, they suggest a certain degree of callousness or lack of regret. How many people felt that? None of you? Oh, one, good. <laughs> on a deeper level, Camus seems to be saying that one should not regret, but accept guilt. What's his thinking here? He's in many ways, again, reflecting one of Nietzsche's ideas, that we cannot will backwards. That's a fundamental law. You cannot change what has happened. The past cannot be undone. And moreover, one should not choose to do so as regret is actually a resentment against life and freedom itself. To negate any past event, demand that one also negate all the consequences that followed on from that event. Never thought of it that way. Had there been no World War II, many of us would not be here. I wouldn't. My parents met because of World War II. So if I negate World War II, logically I have to negate my existence. That's the problem Nietzsche saw with negating the past. And that's, I think, what Camus was trying to say here. Rather than negate it, rather than regret it, accept you're guilty, you did it, and live with it. Try to change your life from then on, because that can be affected, but live with the guilt. Because the guilt is what is provided by your freedom. That's a tough one, isn't it? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Guilt is the price one pays for freedom. Thus, Clarence exposes freedom not as some gift, as many suppose, we're free, but rather as a curse, a type of fall, a fall from Eden, which must be heroically born. You gotta bear that. You've got to bear the fact that you have to choose. There's no one who's going to take responsibility except you. And if you're wrong, you live with it. Or you go see the psychiatrist. <laughs> or both. As he states, this is a lengthy passage, but I think it's one that you should memorize. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was always talking of freedom. At breakfast, I used to spread it on my toast. I used to chew it all day long. And in company, my breath was delightfully redolent of freedom. With that key word, I would bludgeon whoever contradicted me. I made it serve my desires and my power. I used to whisper it in bed in the ear of my sleeping mates. And it helped me drop them. Just imagine my naivete. Defended it two or three times without, without, of course, going so far as to die for it, but nevertheless taking a few risks. I must be forgiven such rash acts. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know that freedom is not a reward or a decoration that is celebrated with champagne nor yet a gift, a box of dainties designed to make you lick your chops. Oh no, it's a choice. On the contrary, and a long distant race, quite solitary and very exhausting. No champagne, no friends raising their glasses as they look at you affectionately, alone in a forbidding room, alone in the prisoner's box before the judges, more so are those who would judge you if they really knew you. And alone to decide in face of oneself in the face of others' judgment. At the end of all freedom, 
is a court sentence. That's why freedom is too heavy to bear, especially when you're down with a fever, distressed, or love nobody. A little different view of freedom. Freedom requires a heavy responsibility, and that's why many of the existentialists say people will give it up like that. Make me secure, happy, warm. That's what I want. Don't give me freedom, because freedom <coughs> has the possibility of going very, very wrong. 